um, I brought the 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 um, banner for Women's Day, and it's entitled The Crown. And as I just said, we are having our Women's Day this Saturday, and it's, it'll be amazing. But I want to talk a little bit about um, the title, like what it was inspired by. And so the theme was actually inspired by a beloved show on Netflix called The Crown. Has it, have any of you guys ever saw it? Okay, yeah. It's a good show. Clearly, I watch it. No, I'm joking. But um, it's, about, it's a docuseries about the life of the late Queen Elizabeth II. And um, she, she died September 8th, 2022 at 96 years old. But get this, she was the longest reigning queen for 70 years and the longest reigning monarch in British history. So for 70 years, that's like seven decades she reigned. But as you start to watch the show, one of the things that they talk about, and it's fairly accurate, um, especially, in the, especially the first season. The first season, is, the first season is very accurate because they're telling about how she became queen, so it's based on historical facts. Um, but what captured my attention regarding the show is that originally she did not want to be queen. Actually, she wasn't even in the, um, what do they call it, like the, um, the what? Yeah, the secession to be queen. So what happened was her, her father's brother, um, King Edward, he um, abdicated the, the kingship in his first year. So what that means is that he gave, he gave up the throne because he wanted to marry a woman that had been divorced, right? So he fell in love um, with this, this woman, and in his first year, he had to make a decision if he was going to marry her or lose the relationship and remain king, and he chose her. And so when that happened, uh, Queen Elizabeth's father, King George, became king. So can you imagine, like, I mean, monarchy, it's, it's kind of hard for us to understand because we just don't, like, you know, America is diplomatic and we don't live that way. But, like, can you imagine just, like, one day, you wake up, you're just a regular girl. The next day, you're like the heir to the throne. Yeah. And, <laughs> and um, it just, <laughs> Mariah is on it tonight, right? Um, it just like, it reminds me of discipleship, right? Like one day you're just living your sinful life. And then all of a sudden you start studying the Bible and now you are moving to Zimbabwe somewhere to go <laughs> preach the gospel. Like I know that's in a bit of exaggeration, but like m most of us did not wake up or, or, or envision our lives in being disciples. Right. And amen, like there's the amazing things that comes with that. We have forgiveness of sins. We have a new life with God. We have all these amazing benefits. But the thing that sometimes kind of um, weighs us down is when we're not close to God, we feel the responsibility and the weight of it all, right? Like, um, or I'll be open, I can go there. Like, man, like, th this just was not what I envisioned, you know? And I'm doing more than I ever imagined. And in some ways, that's amazing. But in some ways, if you're not spiritual, you can resent that. And so I was really moved by the show because she, Queen Elizabeth had to navigate that in her early years of, of, of embracing a call that wasn't originally her idea. And so that's what I want to talk about tonight. And the title of the lesson is Polish Your Crown. Polish Your Crown, right? Because when we become disciples, we get crowns, right? We get the crown of life. We get uh, the crown of salvation. We get the crown of righteousness. We get these crowns, but how do they look? Are they chipped? Is it dingy right now? Is it like, is there, you know, like rust? You know, because the longer we've been walking with God, you know, you, is it tilted? Um, and I want to talk about that because we all have a crown if we are true disciples, but you got to ask, what's the state of your crown right now? So look over in Isaiah chapter 62. And in Isaiah chapter 62, verse 3 to 5, it says, You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. No longer will they call you deserted or name you land desolate, but you will be called Hephzibah and your land Beulah, for the Lord will take delight in you, and your land will be married. As a young man marries a young woman, 
so, you, so will your builder marry, marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. And I want to start by asking the question, do you understand who you are before God? Like, this is what happens when we um, become disciples. It's like you are married to God. Like your land was desolate, and now it is like a, fruit, a, um, a fruitful, um, plentiful land. Um, the other thing that happens is that you enter into a covenant relationship, but it says that God rejoices over you. It's like, it's not just like, okay, I just adopted this girl. It's like, no, like, wow. It's the equivalent of when, um, you know, I don't know if this has happened. Some of you, if you have children, it's like, you know, when they give your, uh, you know, when they give the baby to you for the first time, it's a very scary moment. It's like, oh my gosh, like. I'm responsible for this person. But it's beautiful, though, you know? But, it, but it's like, it, that's how God is like with us. It's like, wow, like, this is mine. She's mine, you know? Um, and then the other thing that happens is in 1 Peter 2, 9, you can reference the scripture, but it says you become a royal priesthood and a holy nation, and you also become God's special possession. But many people miss this next part of the scripture in verse 9, 1 Peter 2, verse 9. It says that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So the first thing when we, when we find out that the real royalty that God calls us to do is declare his praises. Yeah. And I think that's missed. It's like we're just like, okay, yes. I want to be in the light. Right. But there's a purpose for that. If it wasn't a purpose for that, then honestly, when we came out that water, it'd be just be easier for us to go to heaven because you don't want to like mess up, right. you know, the potential of falling away. Right? right. But the reason why he leaves us is because we're supposed to be the ones that now become ambassadors and we declare the praises to other women and other men about God. And so I want to ask us, how has it been going declaring praises about God? And I'm not just talking about sharing your faith. I think, like, yes, evangelism is a part of it. But your life should model Jesus Christ. And that's something that you, it, it's not just um, intellectual. It has to become our hearts. But it starts with us knowing that we're royalty in God. Because if you don't believe that you're royalty, then you don't think you're royal. So when you don't think that you're royal, you're not going to act like royalty. You're going to act like, oh, yeah, like, I just, you know, I'm another girl. And it's like, no, you need to understand who you are so that you can understand who God wants you to be for him and also to help others. And there's three ways we can polish our crowns off so that they can shine for God. The first point is polish anxiety off your crown. Look in Luke chapter 10. So um, on Monday nights, we have a, a staff meeting for those that... Um, you know, serve in any capacity in the church. And OJ talked about Martha and Mary. Okay, and I want to be honest. Sometimes I don't like when men talk about Martha and Mary because I'm just like, dude, you just don't understand. Like, I understand Martha. You know, like, Martha is my girl. So I've studied this out a lot. Like, I've read commentaries on it because it's, it's basically like, oh, yeah, Martha, Martha, you don't want your name called twice, da-da-da-da-da. And amen, that's great. But it's like, as a woman, you've been Martha. You've been like, look at all these preparations that need to be made, and he's not helping me. No, I'm just no. <laughs> but, but let's read Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Now, I want to read it in the voice version. It really impacted my heart. It says, Jesus continued from there toward Jerusalem and came to another village. Martha, a resident of that village, welcomed Jesus into her home. Her sister Mary went and sat at Jesus' feet, listening to him teach. Meanwhile, Martha was anxious about all the hospitality arrangements. Martha, interrupting Jesus, Lord, why don't you care? My sister is leaving me to do all the work by myself. Tell her to get over here and help me. Oh, Martha, Martha, you are so anxious and concerned about a million details, but really only one thing matters. Mary has chosen that one thing, and I won't take it away from her. And I think that we have to polish off anxiety. And so here's, here's 
where I've come to the conviction what Jesus was trying to teach Martha is that like every other, you know, responsible man or woman, the preparations Jesus said, like they did have to be done. So to me, those are the responsibilities of our life. You know, I know for me this week, there's just been a lot of moving, you know, it's Women's Day, there's other things going on. My mom's coming into town. It's her birthday. I was just talking to Kenji, like, can you help me with my mom's birthday? But it's like, we have these things that have to be done, right? But the issue that I think Jesus was really addressing with Martha is that she picked either or versus both. And she picked the distractions and the preparations over focusing on her relationship with God. And that was the issue. Mary understood what was most important in the moment. Jesus was there. Like, it wasn't like Jesus was coming. It wasn't like Jesus was about to leave. Jesus was there. So in the moment, you know what the priority was? Gleaning from Jesus. And that's where Martha went wrong. And I think that's where many of us go wrong. It's not that you neglect one for the other. It's the fact that you have to know the priority so that you won't get anxious about doing the preparations. And I was, I really learned this lesson this week. So Monday um, I woke up and it's like, I could just feel everything that I needed to do. Like I was just like, oh, my mind, like I have like probably 10 or 15 seconds of my mind wakes up and it's like, wah. It's like your mind is booting up. And then after those 15 seconds, it was just like, and I just got really overwhelmed and like, it's almost like paralysis by analysis. It's like, I didn't, like, then you don't want to do anything. You're just sitting there like a sitting duck. And I sat in the bed for like 30 minutes. And I'm like, okay, well, I got to get my son up for school. So at least me, at least start there. And then as I was doing that, I got him ready for school. And then, um, and then all of a sudden, like, I felt it. It was like a tear, like that one tear. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm about to break down. Cause it wasn't that. It, I was feeling it, but I didn't want to, like, fight in prayer to deal with it, right? It was like I was just going to try to just white knuckle through it, but my emotions wouldn't let me. And I was like, hey, can you take Micah to school? Because I really need to pray. And I just prayed, and I was just praying, like, God this, God that. And what I really realized, the, the root issue was that I was afraid of not having control. That's what it boiled down to. And then for some reason I got into my mind that if I didn't have control over everything or if everything didn't go well, then I would be a failure. Now saying that out loud to me right now, I mean to you guys right now, sounds crazy. But I literally felt that. But I had to go to prayer to be able to work that out so that it wouldn't like, um, like uh, keep me down the whole week. And so that's what was happening with Martha. It's like she got mad because she wasn't going to God for help. And you got to ask yourself, are you upset right now? Are you anxious? Are you like edgy? You know, when you're edgy, like someone says, hi, hi, you know, like, oh, <laughs> hey, you know, whenever you're edgy, you need to go pray. And God wants you to. And let, I want to talk about four things that spending time with God helps with. One, it help. well, um, not, not it helps us with, but we can do when we go to God. One is talk to him about your needs. Two is be thankful for what he's already done and the past miracles that he's already worked out because they help you understand that he can do it again and he will do it again. And then three, praying helps us to focus back on God when life just feels like a lot. And so... This is what helps us to be able to throw off the anxiety and not that we don't have to do these responsibilities or, or, or uh, have to take care of them, but it's just putting God in the right priority so that you can deal with what comes with life. And our second point is polish bitterness off your crown. And in Job 36 verse 13, you guys can turn there. Job, Job 36, chapter 36, verse 13, it says, The godless in heart harbor resentment. Even when he fetters them, they do not cry for help. 
And then in Hebrews 12, verse 15, in the NLT version, it says, look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. And I love Job 36 because it, talks, it um, talks about how um, bitterness and um, resentment are, are godless. And when you first read this, you're like, well, that's kind of harsh. Um, but it makes more sense because when you're bitter, your heart is actually not desiring to get close to God. Like, like you can't have both at the same time. Like, I know, like, if I'm struggling or about a situation with bitterness, my mind isn't really thinking about God. It's thinking about the situation, the circumstance, or, you know, how, how, how I've been wronged. And so the reason why bitterness is so, um, and keeps us from our, our relationship with God and is so detrimental is because it kind of blinds you from, like, even seeing the gravity of your own sin. Like, bitterness and, and um, self-righteousness always go hand in hand. Like, whenever, whenever, you know, I've been bitter or I've listened to somebody and they're bitter, it's like they're completely blind about their own life. You know, it's like, you know, I, didn't we just talk about this personally? Or, or even, you know, I've gotten help sometimes. Like, hey, you know, you, <laughs> you sound kind of bitter. <laughs> it's like, no, 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 I'm not bitter. I'm just trying to explain to you what happened. <laughs> it's like, and you know what helps with bitterness understanding the gravity of forgiveness from God and his unlimited patience with us. Because at the end of the day, like, I think this is important to note. We are amazing disciples, and yes, we have a relationship with God, but we're sinners. And so what do sinners do to one another? They sin, and we hurt each other. And so to think that we're not going to have to navigate, like, conflict resolution or, or bitterness in our hearts is almost like, delusion but what helps us is if you look in Matthew chapter 18 and also you got to know like your your um your triggers for bitterness right for some people it's you know relationships like something happens someone says something you know a tone something like that for others, it's like a circumstance, like a circumstance that reminds you of something that happened or a circumstance that, like, you just don't like. And then for others, sometimes it could just be, like, a situation that you feel like you don't have any type of say-so or control over. For me, it's typically, like, circumstances that I don't feel like I have control over. Like, I don't like to feel like there is just absolutely nothing I can do about something. Like... To me, that's just like such a, I mean, it's a, it's a good feeling because it's humbling, but I just, I, I fight that. I fight feeling like, oh, like I can't do anything about this. Like I can't say anything. I can't, oh, like I just get, I don't know why it bothers me. And then I feel the bitterness raging up. And in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, it says, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancel all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. 
This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So this is a really um, convicting scripture. But I believe this is the essence of why God despises bitterness is because it does not allow us to see the gravity of what Jesus has forgiven us of. And so I have a few practicals whenever you feel like you're struggling with bitterness. The first practical is, one, if it's a person, obviously pray and go and talk to them, right? That goes without saying, Matthew 18. But two, write down why you feel this is such an injustice to you. Because usually, like, it's deeper than just the circumstance that happened. There's usually some deeper-rooted things for us of why this bothered us so much, you know? And the third one is write out a list of everything that you can think of in that moment that God has forgiven you of. That helps me a lot, you know, if, if I'm thinking about man, like, oh, my gosh. And then usually my heart softens and I'm like, okay, God, I understand. Let me either go get resolved or if it's a circumstance, let me just be surrendered. Um, but really polish off your crown of bitterness if that's something that you struggle with. And our final one is polish the world off your crown. And look in James chapter 4. And in James chapter 4, we'll start in verse 4. And it says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously, jealously longs for the spirit that he has caused to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace? That is why scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And this scripture talks about the being adulterous people, that understanding that friendship, when, um, friendship with the world means enmity against God. And enmity translates to hatred towards God, against God. And I want to talk about this a little bit because I think there's two extremes. Like we are um, of the world, but we're not in the world. And the Bible does t talk to us about um, becoming all things to all people but for the sake of converting them over to Christ. Right. So there is a level of, you know, relatability. Like, you know, we don't walk around in, uh, you know, nun gear and, you know, have pamphlets sharing with people. It's just like, there's a relatability factor that we just don't do that, right? Mm -hmm. But we also aren't taking pamphlets in the club and like partying with people handing out church invites. <laughs> so you see what I'm saying? Like, there's a huge difference. But I think if we don't understand, like, what God means by not having friendship with the world, we can feel like, oh, no, like, I, I need to be relatable. But really what you're saying is I, need to, I want to be worldly. Yeah. And it's a big difference. And so let me, let me talk about it a little bit in this regard. Okay, so here's the thing. We are called to be set apart and holy. And what that means is that you are going to have situations where you might be the only person that has the same convictions that you have. And you have to be okay with that for God. Because when you start compromising on your convictions, eventually what it turns into is that you no longer have convictions. And convictions don't always mean that you're going and you're, you know, preaching at people. Convictions can just simply mean that I decide not to participate in that. And the Bible says in, um, look in 1 Corinthians chapter, another thing I want to talk about is making sure that we understand um, what it means to have godly relationships and friendships. So if you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 33, the Bible says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. 
and we'll stop there. But the Bible explicitly says that bad company corrupts good character. So what that means is that even when we are, you know, trying to impact people and even when we are trying to reach out to them, make no mistake, if you are in bad company a long time, it, your character will be corrupted. And I remember it was maybe like four years ago, I had started this new job and um, I was just like really in love with the job. And OJ kept saying like, yeah, I don't know about this job. And I'm just like, you know, don't hate on me. Just kidding. You know, like, <laughs> anyway, I didn't say that, but like we, we had a moment of that because I just could not understand what he, what he saw wrong. I'm like, I feel loved here. These people, like they would buy Starbucks every day. It was in Miami. So it's like this thing called cafecito. They like, they're going around, they're pouring the coffee. I had got two promotions and I was just like, I, honestly, I was happy like I was like I, I'll even like he was like you even like talk differently I'm like what do you mean so so anyway um I just fell in love with this job I have to be honest I fell in love with it. I love the people I love the company I loved everything about it so then what started happening was that you know because I felt like these are these are my peeps right here they're inviting me out to everything right so I'm like, okay, OJ, like, what do you think about, you know, Thursday night? You don't mind if I go hang out? I mean, it's not, it's just a restaurant. He's, that becomes like, oh, it's a work meeting. It's like, this is not a work meeting. You can decide if you want to come. I'm just going out to hang out with these people because I think they're cool. And quite frankly, I'm having fun with them. <laughs> now, granted, they would, go, you know, it, they were just going out to restaurants and eating. But then it started turning into like, oh, hey, do you want to come to um, this party with us? Or, hey, you want to come? They used to have, um, in Miami, they do a lot of, like, yacht um, yacht and, like, ship parties. And um, they're inviting me to that. Now, why are they inviting me to this? First of all, let's take discipleship out of it. I am a married woman. Why are you inviting me? You know why I wasn't saying anything? They knew a part of my life, and it's my, because I was like, oh, yeah, like, introduce yourself how you do oh I'm Jalisa and I didn't have my um because um when we got married I didn't um immediately change over my um my license so I'm Jalisa Pullins I'm not even like Jalisa and Duca and I started I started introducing myself as Jalisa Pullins worldly yeah. right and then and there came a point in time, and I'm being, I'm being open about this because I understand it. I'm not just saying these things because, you know, you think like, oh, she's up there preaching. It's like, no, guys, you, we all live the same lives. Right. Like, you're not special. There's nothing happening in your life that's just like, oh, this is just happening to me. People have been sinning from the beginning of time. Right. Like, they have. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm Jaleesa Pullen. So I'm like, I'm trying to talk OJ into letting me go to a yacht party <laughs> as a disciple. Can you, a married disciple, thank you, Yolanda. But, that, but I couldn't see it. I had drifted so far that I was like, I, I mean, I don't see any issues with that. Like, I mean, I'm not like, they're just my friends. Friendship with the world, it's hatred towards God. Because if you have to hide a part of your life to live another life, that's not godly. So you gotta ask yourself, do you love the world? Because at that point in time, I was falling in love with the world, and I could not see it. And I thank God for the discipling, for a spiritual husband, because I couldn't see it. I was blinded by the lights of it all, you know, and blinded by the love of the people, and they, you know, they're really cool with me. I don't even, I don't even talk to those people today. I don't even know where they live. I mean, I would invite them out to something if I knew them, but, it, I mean, if I saw them, but, like, the, something that was so important to me at that point in my life it's like, I don't even know where those people are right now. But I do know who's still faithful and helping me in my relationship with God, my husband. And so you got to ask yourself, like, am I drifting? And if so, get help. Be open about it. Talk to your disciples. We all have those moments. You're not going to make it, you know, this marathon of discipleship without some battle wounds. You, we need each other and get the help that you need. And the other thing is that, you got to get the help that you need so we can help others. And imagine an analogy. Suppose you were homeless, foodless, moneyless, and you found a distant relative. A distant relative found out and came and bought you a house, a car, clothing, 
and food that you wanted. They promised to continue to do this as long as you followed their simple house standards. Right? And then six months later, you're like, hmm, I wonder what it's like to be homeless and foodless again. Huh, it wasn't that bad. I mean, I was in the fresh air. Delusional. But that's how we are when we want to leave our relationship with God to go back to the world. It's like we don't remember who we were. And you have to always remind yourself through the scriptures to remind yourself who you are so that you stay grateful for what you have. And I know that each of us right now, we know a woman or we know women that's going through something very difficult spiritually. In our phones, you know, I definitely, you know, if you meet somebody in public, um, you know, share with them about Women's Day. But I want to focus on those that we know in our, in our phones. It's like there's put God, um, God will put a couple women on your heart. And whoever he puts on your heart, that's who you invite to Women's Day. It's like there's people at your job, women that you know, family members, like whoever those three or four people that God puts on your heart, invite them because they need the crown just like you have your crown. And so I just want to challenge us um, that you are royalty. You don't have to seek royalty. You don't have to go after royalty. You already have your crown. Now go and share that with others. I love you guys.